So let me reiterate here again. Listen carefully. Between the ventricular depolarization, which is the QRS complex, and the ventricular repolarization, which is the T wave, you have a part which is called the ST segment. Okay, between the depolarization and the repolarization, you have the ST segment. The ST segment is isoelectric because during the ST segment, there is no electrical activity. Okay, with that said, now let us look into how the perfusion affects the ACG changes. The, epi the coronary arteries are more accurately called epicardial coronary arteries. That is because they are lying on the outer surface of the heart. So we have epicardium, pericardium, myocardium, endocardium, ventricular cavity. So let me show you a schematic diagram here. This is the myocardium. Okay, let's just take for granted that this is the myocardium. So this is inside the myocardium, that is, this is the ventricular cavity. So this region, that is the innermost part of the myocardium, would be the endocardium. Yes, this is the endocardial surface. If this is the endocardial surface, this would be the pericardium. And on top of that, you would be having what is called the epicardial surface. On your epicardial surface, you will be having epicardial coronary arteries all the arteries that we talked about like right coronary left circumflex right the left anterior descending all of these are epicardial coronary arteries the epicardial coronary arteries supply the blood into the myocardium via these perforators now observe carefully that the perforators do not go the entire depth of the myocardium but just above the endocardium that is the area just above or just beneath the endocardium, the region called subendocardial region of the myocardium. Remember, when I say subendocardium, it is the subendocardial part of the myocardium does not have very good perforator blood supply. So what you may ask, if you have an atherosclerotic plaque rupture producing an obstruction, the part that is most affected by the lack of blood flow, this is the normal blood flow. You can see very clearly that the blood flow is not as good as the rest of the myocardium in this region, which is called the subendocardial region. So the subendocardial region is the most affected by a block. So consider a condition of vulnerable plaque rupture. As the plaque ruptures, as the obstruction is going to become more and more, the first part of the myocardium that is affected by a vulnerable plaque rupture is the subendocardial region. Okay, so if this is your epicardial coronary vessel and this is your myocardium, see that the perforators are stopping short of the subendocardial region, and the first region that is ischemic in an obstruction is going to be the subendocardial region. So, you might ask, how does it really affect the ECG? Normally, remember again that I said that the ECG during the ST segment is flat. Nothing happens during the ST segment. So, let's try and have a look at what do you think would happen during the ST segment. So, here, I would want to bring in so just consider this as one of the ECG leads, maybe lead 5, and uh, I shall show you here coronary artery, and uh, let us say there is a small vulnerable plaque rupture producing a partial block, <clears throat> okay, a partial block over here. So you are quite aware of the depolarization of the heart. It starts from the SA node. Depolarization is not registered on our ECG leads because it is within the pacemaker. Then you have the atrial depolarization. Atrial depolarization shows up in the ECG as the classical P wave. Then you will have the AV nodal delay, which is manifest as PR interval. Following that, you will see depolarization of the ventricle, starting with depolarization of the ventricular septum sorry 
Okay, starting as depolarization of the ventricular septum. Excuse me there. Yes, and following up as depolarization of the free wall. So here is the septal depolarization along the his bundle, and then you will have depolarization of the apex. After the apex, the depolarization spreads from the apex to the base. Apex to the base. This is the base of the heart. So the depolarization is going to spread from the apex upwards towards the base. But remember, if I have a partial block over here, I will have this part of the heart, that is the subendocardial region of this myocardium, will be first affected. So in a partial block, so in an atherosclerotic rupture of a vulnerable plaque, I will have subendocardial ischemia. Remember, after depolarization, the ventricular muscle must contract. So after depolarization, there must be contraction. This is what we call excitation contraction coupling. But for contraction, you require ATP. You require ATP for contraction. Now, if your muscle is ischemic, it does not have glucose, it does not have ATP. So when the depolarization potential reaches here, this muscle will say, oh, I'm so tired. I'm so tired, I don't have ATP. So please depolarize the rest of the ventricle. Let me save some ATP. So what happens to the depolarization as it comes is that the depolarization, excuse me, spreads all over the ventricle except the subendocardial ischemic region. And when it spreads all over the ventricle, that will lead to the classical formation of the QRS complex. So you have a P wave, you have the PR interval and QRS complex. Normally, after that, there is going to be a flat line, that is the ST segment and followed by the T wave. However, remember this part of the ventricle is only ischemic, it is not dead. Since it is not dead, it can contract. It manages to get some degree of ATP after the rest of the ventricle has got depolarized. After the rest of the ventricle has got depolarized, that is after the QRS segment, it will say, oh, now I have enough ATP. Please give me some charge. But the problem here is that this ischemic part can get charge not from the pacemakers, but from the remaining muscles which are now positively charged. So, the remaining muscles will start giving a little bit of current to this fellow. So, this guy gives a little bit of current here. This guy gives a little bit of current to the subendocardial region. So, that will produce a flow of current. And this flow of current is after the depolarization of the ventricle, that is after the QRS. That means this flow of current will happen during the ST segment. So the ST segment is no longer flat, but the ST segment will actually show a change. What change will it show? As you can see, this flow of current seems to be going away from the lead. That is, the, dip, the deflection will be a negative deflection, or this is what we call an ST ST depression, ST depression or even a T inversion. ST depression or T inversion is usually the manifestation of subendocardial, subendocardial ischemia. So the ECG manifestation of the earliest form of ischemia or subendocardial ischemia is ST depression with a T wave inversion, right? So let's remember that, okay? So let's remember that. Subendocardial ischemia is picked up by an ST depression, right? You can pretty much see here that subendocardial ischemia is picked up by, when you have subendocardial ischemia, that will lead to the injury current. We call it the current of injury, the, the current that basically starts flowing away from the already depolarized part of the myocardium to the subendocardial region is what we call the, uh, the current of injury. As the current of injury is going away from 
this uh, lead which is v5 it will produce an st depression and a t inversion in lead 5 so some endocardial ischemia implies st depression on an ecg so using using an ecg you can pick up partial block of your coronaries what if you develop a complete block of the coronaries when the coronary is completely blocked it leads to a full thickness ischemia or what you call a transmural ischemia let us try and see how transmural ischemia will manifest on the ecg here taking you back to the same diagram the depolarization will start at the sa node come to the av node so uh, let me redraw those things again here for you so here is your artery probably the left circumflex and here is the okay, and here we can see how a uh, full thickness or sorry a uh, vulnerable plaque rupture has led to the occlusion of the entire coronary and when such an occlusion occurs it usually produces a transmural infarct so here you can see as compared to the subendocardial ischemia here you can see a transmural ischemia which is much more severe okay obviously because more muscle is getting damaged here in this transmural ischemia so when what does this lead again let us say this is lead v5 what does this lead rec record depolarization of the sa node followed by depolarization of the atria will lead to the formation of the p wave after the p wave there is the depolarization of the av node which is called the pr interval after the pr interval there is depolarization of the ventricle just as i said in the previous example depolarization of the ventricle will start within the ventricular free wall sorry ventricular septum followed by the ventricular apex and then the depolarization will spread through the free wall and as it spreads through the free wall when the current comes here naturally this part of the ventricle is going to say oh i am too ischemic i cannot i don't have the atp so please go depolarize the rest of the places let me gather some atp and then come back so the rest of the ventricle gets depolarized of course this is just a two dimensional representation so the current should be able to jump from here to here using going around the ischemic area so as the rest of this part gets depolarized the ecg will show the p pr interval and the qrs complex that is ventricular depolarization normally after this you will have a flat st followed by a t wave but but in this case because of transmural ischemia the rest of the ventricle gets depolarized and then this ischemic portion will manage to gather up enough atp and when it manages to gather up enough atp it would say please give me some of the electrical charge now i want to contract so who is going to give the electrical charge everybody who is depolarized will start giving the electrical charge that is you will have electrical charge coming from this part of the heart from this part of the heart from this part of the heart current will start flowing towards this transmural ischemic area and as you can see current will start flowing after the qrs complex that is there will be a deflection of the st observe carefully that the direction of flow of current is towards v5 so in lead v5 instead of having a flat st segment you will have a positive deflection of the st so you will see a positive deflection of this st and this is what you will get right so this is st elevation okay st elevation is usually the marker of transmural ischemia transmural ischemia so this is an st elevation myocardial infarct in ischemia or infarction this is an st depression sometimes this is simply called non st elevation non st elevation simply because st elevation is much more serious why let's look into that so here remember this that subendocardial ischemia will manifest as st depression 
and transmural ischemia because the injury current is towards the uh, electrode it will lead to st elevation okay so as it is given very clearly in your harrison's textbook subendocardial injury will lead to st depression because the injury current is away from it and transmural ischemia will lead to st elevation because the injury current is towards the lead right so the ecg can help you identify what kind of lesion is it is it an st elevation or is it an st depression in that way you would be able to say whether it is a transmural ischemia or a subendocardial ischemia it tells you the severity of the lesion another interesting thing is that the ecg changes change over time the ecg changes change over time so it's not that when you have an ecg in change in st elevation mis you're going to directly have okay, you're going to directly have an st elevation in fact in st elevation mi the first sign of an st elevation mi is even before the st segment elevates sometimes the t wave first starts to elevate this part of the st segment starts to elevate so the first manifestation of an st segment elevation mi can be a tall broad t wave tall broad t wave okay such a t wave is sometimes called a hyper acute t wave hyper acute t wave this is called a hyper acute t wave of course this is going to be followed by the classical st segment elevation okay and usually st segment elevations in mi will be concave on the top and this point that is the junction of the qrs with the st segment which is called the j point is elevated this is the classic st elevation st elevation okay so this usually happens within minutes to hours but after some time usually hours to a few days the st elevation now that the myocardium starts repairing itself the st elevation might persist but there will be t inversion okay so the st elevation persists with t inversion this is usually the sign of recovery this is usually telling you that the muscle is recovering okay that once you see the t inversion this usually happens hours to days after the infarction this happens during the first two hours this you will see in the patient of acute coronary syndrome as time goes by in some time what you will start noticing is after a few days you will start noticing deep q waves prominent q waves as the st segment flattens and even the t wave becomes normal so this is what we call q waves q waves is usually seen in days to months okay and this is usually a manifestation of a chronic old infarct this is usually the manifestation of an old infarct so this happens within hours this is the st with t inversion usually happens in a few days and the presence of a q wave usually happens days to months so remember it is not just st segment elevation and t inversion however i would want you to remember this part also we can use the ecg to identify subendocardial ischemia and transmural ischemia even though it is st elevation okay so hyperacute t waves st elevation st elevation followed by t inversion okay whether st becomes flat and finally you are going to have deep q waves this is usually the sequence of stt changes that you will see in ischemic heart disease this is what you will see in your emergency this is what you will see in your icu over the next few days this you will see in the when the patient comes back to you in the opd after several months right okay yes 
You can also remember that a new onset left bundle branch block should also be considered a myocardial infarction. What a left bundle branch block's ECG findings are, we will discuss at another setting. But just remember this, that any of these clinical findings or ECG findings are usually the signs of ischemic heart disease, right? So there are two things that the ECG can tell you. Okay. The ECG can tell you how severe is your infarction? Is it subendocardial? Is it transmural? If it is subendocardial, you will have ST depression. If it is transmural, you will have ST elevation. Number two, the ECG can also tell you if you are having an involvement of the right coronary, left circumflex or left anterior descending because the ST changes, that is ST elevation or ST depression, is going to be either in the inferior leads, lateral leads or anterior leads. At this point, I will tell you that the ECG helps you do three things. One, it helps you identify ischemia. When a patient comes to you with ischemic heart disease, history is usually enough. It's not needed to do an ECG to diagnose ischemia. But if you do an ECG, you will see ST changes and that will confirm your diagnosis. Remember, chronic stable angina, acute coronary syndrome, try and diagnose clinically without an ECG. Right? So where does ECG help you? Once you diagnose acute coronary syndrome, it will tell you how severe it is. Is it subendocardial, ST depression, or is it transmural, ST elevation? It will also tell you where is the lesion, which artery is blocked. Is it in the anterior, left anterior descending, that is V1 to V4? Is it in your left circumflex, 1 AVL, V5, V6? Or is it in the inferior leads, 2, 3 AVF? So if you have understood this, I would uh, ask you to take the quiz below to try and identify the following ECG findings. And we will meet at the end of that.